Hello my wonderful viewers and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today we are going to take a fully spoilery look at chapter 68 of Kaiju number 8. This was a huge chapter, just packed in terms of plot, in terms of world building, in terms of theories crushed, in meta terms with the an early anime announcement, and just in terms of page number, we got nearly 30 pages of material. So I'm going to jump right into the spoilers, so if you don't want to hear any spoilers for Kaiju number 8 chapter 68, you can check out the links below the video to get yourself a copy of my book, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, Monty Python meets Star Trek in the short story collection of human absurdity. So, you'd better have clicked away by now because I am about to lay into the spoilers with my first sentence. I was wrong. I was so, so wrong, and I am so delighted. You see, when Kaiju number 9 had eaten Iso and absorbed him, I had assumed, and I really hadn't even noticed that I had assumed, that Iso was comatose the entire time after he'd been consumed. See, I have a theory that Kafka is going to use Kaiju number 8's degenerative power to save Iso and bring him back. I see it going down basically this way. Kafka is going to be forced by advancing permanent transformation to actually communicate with the little guy inside of him. This will lead to the little guy developing an understanding of what humans in battle suits are, and being able to differentiate between Kaiju number 9, Kaiju number 2, and Iso himself when Kafka inevitably confronts Kaiju number 9 the next time. Then little guy will take over the shared body once again, and will use the so far mysterious degeneration power to strip the kaiju away from the director general's body, free Kokoru's daddy, and return Iso to the land of the living. When I contemplated these future events, I always found myself wondering if Iso would be left with memories of kaiju number 9's actions during the time. And of course it'd be more merciful if he did, and better as a story-wise, would be more merciful to Iso if he didn't remember anything that Kaiju Number Nine had done, but it would be more mer better story-wise if he did remember. See, that was and is the theory. But when I saw page one of this chapter, I was shocked to see that not only was Iso Shinomaya alive, he was fully aware and actively fighting Kaiju Number Nine this entire time. This exposed my own assumptions to me. I realized that at some point I had come to assume that Iso was either completely or just mostly unaware of what was going on around him. Comatose, for lack of a better word. But nope, Big Daddy Shinomiya has been awake, aware, and fighting the entire... What is it? More than two months that he's been digesting inside of Kaiju Number 9? Horrific thought. But what has Iso Shinomiya been doing all that time? Well, we can assume that he has delayed Kaiju Number 9's plans, at the very least, by fighting to deny Kaiju Number 9 full access to the information locked away in his brain. Iso's refusal to be absorbed might be the very thing that was preventing Kaiju Number 9 from physically regenerating as well. Remember when we saw him down in his throne room under the sea, he still didn't have all of his legs. Those are the big two, obviously. However, I suspect we might be able to lay something a bit more proactive at Iso's mental doorstep. The appearances of those harb harbinger kaiju. Let's look at how the story is laid out. First, we see a glimpse of Big Daddy Shinomaya in the kaiju number 8 mental scape, and Iso is pondering and commenting on how quickly kaiju numbers 9's new, ki new baby kaiju are developing. Then we immediately cut to the list of the Harbinger Kaiju. Let's call them Bear Hunter, Crater Maker, Monolith, Sprinter, Creepy Traffic Floater, Gas Guzzler, and Fish Sucker. Then we cut to the Defense Force's response to these creatures. Then, and only then, do we get the heartrending mental goodbye from Iso as his consciousness fades out and he mentally passes the baton to the next generation, saying that all he can do is leave the situation in their hands. So, here's my question. Was Kaiju number 9 finally able to send his harbingers out to sling fish around the sky and suck oil out of storage containers because the general director had stopped fighting him? Or was the sending of the harbingers the last act of the general director before he lost the ability to directly affect Kaiju number 9? Think about it. The appearances of the Harbingers was each brief, and save for the Crater Maker and the Gas Guzzler, was witnessed by a human. 
Then these creatures disappeared, or rather dissipated. I mean, it says they disappeared, but we have seen multiple times how Kaiju number nine makes his bodies disappear, essentially by letting them fall to dust. Now, they might not have done that. He might actually have developed a teleportation power at this point. We just don't know. But given what we've seen so far, it makes sense that these bodies just turn to dust. So, here's one theory in short. But I'll probably do a whole video on it later. What if Iso had gained the ability to affect or control certain of Kaiju number 9's, let's call them gamma bodies? What if each of these 14 mysterious appearances we see referenced that didn't kill anyone... Was Iso gaining the upper hand for just a few moments and deliberately sending a body out to where it would be noticed by humans and reported to the Defense Force? Then, on realizing what had happened, Kaiju Number 9 would cause the body to dissipate. Now, at this point, I'd say it's equally likely that Kaiju Number 9 was just using he these bodies in a terror campaign and testing the abilities of his children before the big attack. But why would he let them be seen using their powers? Yes, he might be tr trying to instill fear in the population, but is that an important enough reason to risk the Defense Force getting st stats and specs on these things beforehand? Not letting your enemy know what you're capable of is a huge part of any kind of warfare. It's all very curious. Then, of course, we get the emotional hook at the end of the chapter. We get the answer to the question of what numbers weapons Kikoru is going to get. And as many have speculated, she is getting her mother's weapon, the number four weapon. And here I pause to place a regretful wreath on the grave of perhaps my favorite pet kaiju number eight theory. With the appearance of the kaiju number four suit added to added to the statement from Captain Narumi that this is the same weapon that her mother used, not just the same type of weapon, but the same weapon. It is highly unlikely that Hikari Shinomiya's body was absorbed by Kaiju number 9 way back when she was battling Kaiju number 6, as my theory went. Uh, she is, she was probably, her body was probably retrieved, cremated in traditional, uh, manner and that's why we didn't see the bot her bot the body at the memorial service ah uh, well it was a fun theory while it lasted and it, is it isn't entirely dead but unless they found the suit without her body in it which you'd think would have been mentioned by now it's highly unlikely that she was absorbed by kaiju number nine all those years ago i do have a, a question about if they can make more than one suit from each kaiju though they, they said they have at least two users each for numbered weapons 3, 5, and 7. And isn't that a fun little bit of Japanese culture in itself? So does this mean they have a backup candidate if one dies? Or that they can make two numbered weapons 3 and use them at the same time? I guess that's just world building we'll have to get in future chapters. Also, does successfully syncing a numbers weapon with one candidate reduce its compatibility with other candidates? I'm actually quite curious about that. So the, we know the candidates sync to the suits, so you can kind of imagine that the suits would also in turn sync to the candidates. So maybe having one user limits the number of, u of potential users after that. Now that might not be a story critical element, so we might never get an answer, but it's an interesting question to look out for answers to going forward. But there are so many questions and we're going to have to wait a full month before we get any answers. Or rather, let's see, 20, 20 odd days. So please, for the love of my sanity, leave a comment below this video telling me what your theories are for the upcoming combat arc. I have to have something to see me through this dry spell. So hit that like and subscribe button and peace out my wonderful viewers. Humans are weird. We took a vote and humans are weird. I have the data. Two books in a series of human absurdity. Go check out these short story collections what will our little green friends think of us when we finally do make it to space? Find out the answer in t two books of human absurdity. Humans are weird, we took a vote, and humans are weird, I have the data. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo and Google Play.